Welcome back to class. History 3322, winner of several Emmys, Oscars, and a Peabody Award. Okay. Picking up from last time where you learned just about everything you ever needed to know about the six-month period in early 1965, except for what LBJ ate for breakfast. Um, we're going to try to pick up the pace a bit today. Um, last thing we did last time was talk about the major decisions in July of 1965, which led to the so-called Americanization of the war. And in many ways, this period is by far the least known, I think, of uh, when we talk about histories of Vietnam, the, the early period, the period up to uh, 1965. Now we're getting into stuff that I think is going to be a lot more familiar. And in fact, because of that, we probably will do stuff that, that is less detailed because much of this um, is more familiar uh, to us. Um, in July 1965, Westmoreland and McNamara pre present LBJ with a proposal for a fairly significant reinforcement, uh, 44, but the, it's often called the 44 Battalion Request. And LBJ uh, gives that to Westmoreland. He agrees to it and agrees to send more troops, quote, as requested. So on one hand, this is a massive commitment. It's, it, it really is a takeover of the war. What it means is that the Americans will now become responsible for combat in Vietnam. At the same time, LBJ limits, in a sense, his commitment by refusing to mobilize the reserves or to put the country on any kind of a war footing uh, to mobilize the economy or anything like that, uh, as was done, you know, for example, during World War II. So essentially, the LBJ is going to continue a guns and butter policy. This is a term that's often used at the time and one that I'll use from time to time, and we'll talk more about it. And it, in the, it later uh, in this class, we'll talk uh, more about that, too. Um, Johnson has two major goals. One is to uh, both increase and expand the economy at home while, while uh, uh, encouraging reform, and the other, of course, is Vietnam. Rather than make a choice, he decides to go for both guns and butter. So if you, um, for example, mobilize the economy for war, that would uh, mean that the government would make rigid controls or things like that. And Johnson doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to upset natural economic cycles because the economy is quite strong. It's quite hot in the 1960s. So he decides not to do that and angers quite a lot of people because, uh, uh, well, Harry Summers, for instance, believes that uh, this was really the fatal mistake LBJ made by not declaring war by not mobilizing the country for war, by not putting the country on a war footing, Johnson never gave the impression that this was serious business. Okay? I, I disagree with that, but, but that is a common uh, uh, conception, that this was really a major mistake. And Larry Berman says that you know, in so doing, Johnson decided to lose the war slowly. And Berman has a point. Even if you disagree with the idea that mobilization or activation of the reserves would have made a difference, it's quite clear that Johnson is going to take less than a comprehensive approach. Now, when you say lose the war slowly, there's an implication there that he could have done something to not lose the war slowly. As far as I'm concerned, the alternative would be to lose the war more quickly. I, I don't think that Johnson could have seized upon a policy that ultimately would have succeeded. I mean, the Vietnamese maybe, but the Americans I, 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 I have my doubts about. And we're going to spend a lot of time dealing with issues like that as we go on. So this is kind of where we are right now. And we'll go to. Uh, uh, you know, we'll start talking about the war now, and this is, in a sense, a new war. And I put new in quotation marks um, because, obviously, the, it's, it's not new in the sense that something has happened to change what had happened before. Um, the war continues along lines that have already been established. It's new in the sense, though, that the Americans have taken over uh, primary emphasis for it. Now, for years, American military people especially have been warning against this from... Uh, the early 1950s on, uh, Secretary Marshall, you know, who was in general of the Army, Eisenhower, Ridgway, Gavin, Maxwell Taylor, and even Westmoreland, just a few months prior to that, remember in January of 65, Westmoreland warns against taking on too much control because then we'll find ourselves like the French, occupying an essentially hostile foreign country. Yet six months later, this is what they do. So in that regard, it is a new war. And it's an expanded war as well. This is just a, a photo. This is kind of a symbolic of the whole thing. It's so big you really can't see it. But this is a burned out uh, village which was suspected of harboring Viet Cong. And the Americans, as you can see, using air power go in and really cut a huge swath through this entire village. Um, 
this always reminds me of a quote, uh, 1957, uh, Air Force uh, uh, General Otto Weiland, uh, just really, in a sense, speaking off the talk, top of his head, said, uh, the thought of B-52s being used in Indochina is, is ridiculous, and, and we should never even think of doing anything like that. And I always thought it was ironic that he kind of picked Indochina out, because no one was really thinking of it at the time. Uh, he could have said anywhere, and the, the quote would have had the same impact. Yet that's exactly what happened, so a lot of people really were, were quite stunned by it. Uh, by mid-65, not only do you have a, an air war, which is uh, going fairly, pretty much in full bore, rolling thunder, uh, you have B-52 attacks. Now, B-52s, as I said, are part of arc light, so there, there is a distinction there. Rolling Thunder, arc light are two separate air campaigns, massive air campaigns. And now you also have increasing ground combat, uh, which is going to become quite heavy shortly after the summer of 1965. And really, uh, the you know, kind of pivotal battle here is the Battle of Yadrong Valley, which really, I think, signals a new approach, a new war. So. Um, the United States is, is clearly committed now to a direct and increasing military involvement. Uh, what, what do the, what's the Vietnamese take on that? What's the communist take on that? Um, Le Duan, who was one of Ho's oldest uh, confidants and one of the leading theorists, uh, believed and still believed that it was possible to defeat the southern Vietnamese before large-scale U.S. intervention and the Viet Cong are still pursuing a policy, even into the summer of 1965, of military attacks, uh, but not large-scale military involvement, kind of a continued guerrilla war with attacks on central locations, on key government or military areas, uh, and continued political unrest in Saigon. And as we'll see, that's continuing. Uh, to suggest that the South Vietnamese ever had any kind of real political stability is, is really kind of erroneous. The, there's still unrest. There's, there's kind of coercion and stability in that regard, but it's still fairly difficult. So the Vietnamese still believe that they can, um, through a general offensive, stir the South Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, the NLF, the communists believe that they can, through these continued assaults, stir the population in the South into a general uprising. They're still trying to have the South defeat itself so that they don't have to do it. This is still the goal. Now, in mid-1965, however, they begin to start to hurry things up. They, they don't believe that with massive U.S. intervention, this is going to be any easier. So they're still hoping to finish this thing off before the U.S. comes in in force. And at the same time, and we'll talk about this later, they can't really rely on their allies, especially Mao Zedong. Uh, the Chinese line on this was that it was Vietnam's responsibility, not the Chinese responsibility. So, again, at the same time that Johnson and others are saying that Ho Chi Minh is a puppet of Mao Zedong, in fact, China is offering Ho some support, but not anywhere near the level that one uh, might indicate uh, from listening to American reports. So when LBJ commits in 1965, this is going to, you know, ultimately change communist strategy. Um, the first major meeting that the Vietnamese have occurs in um, uh, September of 1965, just a few months after Johnson's Americanization. The Politburo meets in Hanoi, and they still, at this point, expect a fairly limited war. They don't expect any attacks uh, on North Vietnam, per se, because they realize that Johnson, if he does this, would risk a much wider war against perhaps the Soviet Union or China. Uh, they also understand, and this is critical and it's going to last throughout the entire war, uh, that the United States is plagued by a weak ally. They often refer to it as a puppet government. The NLF and the communists always refer to the South as the puppet regime. And they believe that uh, because the U.S. is plagued with this uncertain, uh, very weak ally and doesn't have a lot of support at home, and Ho and the NLF is always aware of American attitudes toward the war, that they can hold out. So a lot, of times, you know, a, a lot of times you'll see people talk about Vietnam as a military victory but a psychological defeat. And it's hard to separate those things. I mean, that's part of the strategy. Military strategy isn't made in a vacuum. It's not compartmentalized. You have to take all this into account. And, and that's part of the Vietnamese strategy. You know, we will assault and attack them, keep them on their toes, keep them guessing, and at the same time count on instability in the South and an uncertain political climate in the United States, and that will ultimately bring us victory.
So it wasn't a fluke. I mean, this was really part of the longer term uh, a commitment there. Um, one erroneous conception that the Vietnamese had was that Washington would at some point back down because it was more likely to accept a small defeat in Vietnam rather than a larger defeat in the region or globally. So in a sense, they believe, like Henry Kissinger believed that Vietnam had a breaking point, the Vietnamese believe the U.S. has a breaking point too. And it will wise up and accept Vietnam as a failure and move on rather than stay there and risk even greater losses to its credibility or actual military losses if China or the Soviet Union intervenes. So in a sense, both of them are making the same assumption. It's, it's you know, to put it, you know, somebody, it's some, something of a game of chicken, you know, although that's kind of demeans it, but you get the point, you know, that, that both sides expect the other to break <coughs> at, at some point. Um, at the same time, however, the Vietnamese are preparing, as always, for the worst, and they confirm in September of 1965 Ja Po, Le Duan, and others, uh, that the strategy of protracted war, which we've talked about before, remains valid. And again, this is, this is a combination of, of uh, military and political strategy, right? I mean, a key element of protracted war is maintaining political support among people who support you, uh, counting on political unrest in the South, and understanding that the political climate in the U.S. will remain uncertain. So protracted warfare is military and political, both. All right. Um, so this is basically the, the communist strategy. Uh, they decide that things have changed, clearly. The massive American commitment changes everything. But at the same time, uh, even though the situation has changed, their strategy remains fairly consistent, and they're not going to, um, they're not going to change it. In fact, uh, Ho Chi Minh um, uh, announces, he's interviewed, and he says, uh, Johnson and his clique, clique, C-L-I-Q-U-E, Johnson and the Southern Vietnamese, Johnson and his clique should recognize this. They can bring in 500,000 troops, 1 million, or even more to step up their war of aggression in South Vietnam. They may use thousands of aircraft for intensified attacks against North Vietnam, but never will they break the iron will of the historic Vietnamese people to fight against U.S. aggression for national salvation. The war can last 10, 20 years or longer, but the Vietnamese people will not be intimidated. Nothing is more precious than independence and freedom. This is Ho in mid-65 after Americanization. It sounds like rhetoric. It sounds like good, you know, kind of communist rhetoric and whatnot, but there is beyond that, as, as we've seen through, you know, in the first several weeks of this course, it really does speak to a Vietnamese tradition as well. And one, you know, can dismiss it as mere rhetoric, but at the same time, if you're familiar with uh, uh, Vietnam's tradition, the fights against the Chinese or the Mongols or the French, uh, the fight thus far against the Americans, it makes a lot of sense. In fact, um, in those crucial uh, debates or discussions or whatever you want to call them, in July of 1965 and thereafter, Harold K. Johnson, the Army Chief of Staff, was asked what he thought about Ho's statement. And he said, oh, I believe it. There's no question about it. I mean, people sometimes dismiss it as rhetoric, but American officials took it as, as being deadly serious. They understood that when Ho said, we'll fight for 10 or 20 more years, and we don't care how many people they bring her and how many we lose, he meant it. Now, Ho has the capability to get away with this, both because he has a mantle of nationalism and also because in the North, the Politburo has a great deal of control over, over Northern society in a way, for instance, that LBJ doesn't have at home. I mean, wartime brings a great deal of power to the central authority. If you look at, for example, the role of the central government in World War II versus in a period that wasn't at war in the United States or in Britain or in any Western democracy, you see it's a huge change. I mean, you know, FDR puts Chinese in, in, in concentration camps. The central government can suspend, during the Civil War, Lincoln suspends certain constitutional liberties. So wartime brings a great deal of control, and Ho has this. Ho can basically uh, coerce and control northern Vietnamese society at a level far greater than, for example, the U.S. can. So there are many in the United States who believe it when Ho says this. They realize it's not just um, empty rhetoric. Okay? Uh, at the same time, then, that Ho is committed, he also understands that the American intervention has changed things. And you start to see greater infiltration. Uh, this is an area that I think we're still learning more about, the, the, the concept of northern infiltration into the south. Uh, the initial Viet Cong, NLF, was mostly Southern, almost overwhelmingly Southern, people who remained in the South after 1954, essentially an indigenous movement. Uh, 
Now, you started to see movement north and south, but quite often they were people who from the south went north for training, for uh, indoctrination, or, or whatever you want to call it, and then would come back. They were called regroupees. And in the early 1960s, most of the Viet Cong and NLF came from the south through recruitment. The Viet Cong were very good at recruiting among people in the south. But as the Americans pour in, the Viet Cong start to take heavy casualties. And you'll start to see first trickles and then larger numbers of northerners coming down across the 17th parallel to fight in the south. The numbers were never as great, for example, as a lot of American officials would indicate. And um, the uh, uh, Viet Cong still remained essentially a southern force. And I'll talk about that later. I mean, American military officials recognized that as well. So even though publicly, uh, JFK, LBJ, and Nixon will still portray Vietnam as a war of northern invasion of the south. Um, the numbers don't really speak to that. I mean, clearly there was infiltration, but it remained a southern war, and of course that bespeaks the, the political aspect of it, which is, you know, this is one country, does one invade the other? Although I guess in Texas one would say that the Union invaded the Confederacy, right? Uh, and, 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 it's, and it's similar in that regard. So, um, what's, what's the situation then in mid-65? The Viet Cong now finds itself in war directly against the United States. What's the role of the Arvin? We'll talk about that. But it's probably going to diminish. I mean, Amer in a sense, this is something I've talked about before. We still need to know a lot more about the Arvin's role. But if one believes American soldiers and American officers from that period, the Arvin did less as the Americans did more. That could be mythic, that could simply be a stereotype, but Americans believe that. And I mean, anybody, not anybody, but most of the people, the vast majority of people you talk to will, will confirm that. American, from the top level, general officers, junior officers, field officers, soldiers, will talk about that. I think, you know, uh, Jonathan Shea, who we'll hear later in the semester, uh, was here, uh, who's worked with a lot of vets, and he said, to this day, soldiers have a deep respect uh, for the, the North Vietnamese soldiers and the least amount of respect for, for the southern allies. Uh, again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but, but there's a perception that that was the case, that they, in fact, as my Taylor and Westmoreland and others suggested, would do less as the Americans did more. Um, and <laughs> that's not an illogical thing either. So at any rate, um, so this is the situation in which uh, uh, the Vietnamese find themselves. Okay. There are also problems, though, with the Allies. So communist strategy is pretty well set. It's not really changing all that much. The level of infiltration may increase, but the, pro the strategy of protracted war remains the same. What's going on in the South? Well, you have continued problems with Arvin. Uh, the series of coups finally ends from the time ZM was overthrown in November 1st, 1963, until uh, the spring of 1965. As I said, there's about a 16-month period in there. Uh, where there were well over a dozen governments. I mean, one really can't peg a certain number because if you look at the number, there, you know, certain people were uh, president at one point and prime minister at another point and vice versa. Uh, but there were dozens of governments, nothing near any kind of political stability. It really was a revolving door, no chance to develop any kind of unity, any kind of uh, any sense of purpose. Uh, uh, corruption, bureaucracy, infighting, intrigue was constant. That finally changes in 1965, and from 65 until 75, really for a decade, you have two men who are going to run the country through that entire period, Nguyen Cao Khi and Nguyen Van Tu. And Nguyen Cao Khi actually becomes the first president. I couldn't find a picture of two, but I have a, it's a great picture of Khi and his wife there. Uh, Nguyen Cao Khi was real flamboyant. He often wore like a purple jumpsuit with a white scarf, and he was a parachutist and a, and a pilot. And his wife, as you can see, is incredibly stylish, quite beautiful. And they were you know, kind of a dashing couple. Uh, you know, kind of the F. Scott Fitzgerald set of uh, Vietnam. Uh, Key also was rumored to have uh, a stake in just about every kind of black market activity uh, in Vietnam. And Key and Two emerge in mid-65 and will remain in power for the next 10 years. Now, quite often the line is finally there was stability. And if you look at stability as having the same people in charge, yeah, that, that's true. But in fact, the intrigue and corruption and political difficulties, as we'll see in a minute, continued. I mean, the Buddhists, for example, the Buddhists are still a major problem and, and quite often will provoke crisis. So you do have, have finally a, uh, a, a, at least a consistent government, if not a stable one. However, um, that does not translate into a new effectiveness. Um, 
again, we talked about the Arvin. One problem the Arvin had, which was, is documentable, is that um, it had a very difficult co time in getting men to uh, show up for military service when drafted or to stay in the Army. Uh, in the early, 19, early to mid-1960s, uh, statistics showed that uh, only about 10 percent, only about 10 percent, a tenth, of young men drafted for the Arvin, the Southern Army, uh, even reported for military service. So that's, that's a fairly significant manpower problem. And by early 1965, this is before, you know, early 1965, it's fairly limited war, but already over 110,000 Arvin troops had deserted. And it's not that difficult to desert. You don't have a national registry. Many of these people are villagers who need to go home. It may be farming time. They may have uh, an ailing parent, a uh, pregnant wife, for all kinds of reasons. They may just be sick of it. Um, so you have a significant desertion problem. It's difficult to track people. You know, you don't have, uh, you know, barcodes and all kinds of sophisticated computers and things like that. So um, this is a significant increase by 1965 and a trend that would grow in the future. At the same time, even with Two and Key, maybe even more with Two and Key, allegations of corruption and bribery and kickbacks remained, and they haunted the, the RVN, the South Vietnamese, for the entire government. Uh, in fact, as I said, Key was rumored to have stakes in all kinds of black market activities. In fact, um, Key and uh, naval officials were rumored to control the, uh, uh, not necessarily control, but have a huge stake in the Southeast Asian opium and heroin trades. And Al McCoy in the politics of heroin uh, uh, goes into uh, some of this stuff at length. So, um, the, uh, you know, among the Army officers, there was still a great deal of black market activity, intrigue, infighting, and so forth. Um, maybe most importantly, Buddhist government tensions continued. Uh, two and Key were both Catholic, and you know, again, I don't want to make too much of that, but, but there is something to it. Uh, two and Key are both Catholic. The Buddhists um, continued to oppose the government. In 1966, nine more Buddhists immolated themselves. Remember, we saw the famous photo from 1963 of the Buddhist bonds. Uh, that continues, and in 1966, uh, nine Buddhist uh, monks uh, very publicly immolate themselves, burn themselves up. Uh, the situation gets worse then in the north. Uh, one of the uh, more popular uh, commanding generals is a, a man named uh, Nguyen Khan T, General T, T H I. And T was quite popular, but also uh, he was a critic and opponent of the government. Uh, Nguyen Cao Ki, the president, fires General T, whose command is in the north in an area called Three Corps, uh, I believe. Uh, yeah, he, uh, T actually worked closely with American Marines in the area who were in the Northern Sectors, Three and Four Corps. I'm sorry, One and Two Corps, I Corps and Two Corps, I'm going backwards. I'm North is One, South is Four. So they were in, in, in I Corps especially, uh, um, Buddhist units. Uh, T himself was in I Corps. Um, when Ki fires General T, the Buddhist, Buddhist troops in Arvin defend T and essentially provoke a civil war within Arvin. Arvin units split according to their loyalty to T and the Buddhist troops raise arms against other Arvin units. So the Arvin is shooting at each other or on the verge of doing that. American Marines led by General Lewis Walt have to intervene and basically stand in between the various Arvin units who are shooting or fighting with each other. It doesn't get terribly bloody or violent fortunately but the fact of the matter is, um, Buddhist troops loyal to General T take up arms against other Arvin units, and American Marines have to intercede to prevent this from boiling over. All right. This provokes, this pr prompts General Victor Krulak, the Marines Pacific commander, and I've used this quote before, to write to the Secretary of the Navy and say, uh, uh, despite all of our assertions to the contrary, the South Vietnamese are not, and they never have been, a nation. And again, I think, you know, this is pretty damning to suggest that, you know, the people you're here to support really are, are nothing but a conglomeration, and in fact, they don't like each other all that much. You know, can you imagine, you know, American units, well, in Vietnam, you can, and we'll talk about that later. I mean, the U.S. has a similar problem with, uh, for example, black and white troops often would, would um, confront each other in Vietnam. Uh, 
troops, you know, white troops might fly a Confederate flag or something like that. It's real hard to fight a war when internally you have that kind of division, when you have units, you know, holding arms against each other, and a third party, in this sense, the United States, or a second party, has to intervene to protect, prevent this from, from boiling over. Um, this is quite damning because since the United States had entered Vietnam, American officials had constantly claimed, I mean, from 1950 onward, that their goal was to build up, to protect the military and the government in the South, to give them the means to take care of themselves, but never to take over the war. That it was always the South Vietnamese own responsibility to fight the VC, to develop their own country. All right? Despite billions of dollars of aid by 1966, despite the presence of over 300,000 American troops by 1966, success was, was still elusive. And in fact, one of the major roles that the Americans play in 1966 is to stand in between Arvin units which are ready to fight each other. So that's a fairly difficult uh, situation. So just as the communist strategy hasn't changed, the Arvin's problems continue. So this isn't a particularly uh, a promising picture. Yeah. In the, uh, reading on, in the reading on working class war, mapping the losses, mm -hmm. um, she estimates that 250,000 South Vietnamese forces were killed. This is from 1954 to 75, yeah. I, I would assume. But still, that, I mean, that's roughly four or five times the number of American losses. And I think those numbers are probably low. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, they had to be doing some fighting somewhere uh, besides, I mean, you know, it, or did they just suffer higher percentage losses when they did go into battle because well, of I mean, bad the, leadership? Well, I mean, the Arvin had, I think, over 700,000 men in uniform, or it may have been a million. It was one of the big, five biggest armies in the world at the time. And, I mean, one could argue statistically, I don't know statistics, that, you know, well, of course you're going to have more desertions because your army is much bigger anyway. Oh, yeah, they fought. There's no question about that. Um, um, you know, yeah, they did fight. Uh, at the same time, um, in terms of morale and discipline and desertions, there was also a significant problem. I don't know statistically how that would compare to another army at the time. I mean, I suspect the American desertion rate, you know, which I am more familiar with, was quite high, too. Statistically, it may have been similar. I mean, the United States suffered a, a fairly significant rate, a problem with desertions, with uh, discipline problems, bad paper discharges, and stuff like that. Yeah. On the uh, U.S. Army desertions, you're talking about, what, maybe 50 per thousand? Uh, no, I don't think it was quite that high, although um, I don't have the numbers with me. I think the Marines actually had a bigger desertion problem. I think at one point it was 27 per thousand. For other units, it was about 16. Um, I've seen various percentages on the number of people in the Vietnam era who got dishon less than honorable discharges. And a one, one of the, the highest number I saw was nearly a third. And I, that one I'm kind of a little skeptical about. That's, that's tremendous. That's, that would be, you know, I think 800,000 or something like that because there were about 2.5 million people who served in uniform in that era. So I don't know. But, I mean, the Americans had a fairly significant desertion problem, too. Um, even though the Vietnamese fought and took a large number of casualties, and I think that 250,000 figure is probably low, actually. Um, uh, they also, you know, uh, there was a great deal of intrigue, a great deal of, 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 of problems associated with it. I mean, the Americans, you know, at any given time never had that many people actually in combat. I mean, when the United States had 500,000 troops in country, um, you had maybe 50,000 who were actually fighting. I mean, you had more than that assigned to combat units, but in terms of actually seeing combat, actually engaging the enemy, it was probably no more than 10%. So when you're dealing with numbers like that, then 58,000 casualties is fairly significant. And the Vietnamese, of course, were, you know, there were more of them, so they were a better target for the Viet Cong. Uh, and the war last, you know, 20 years, you know, you can, you can you see a lot of destruction, a lot of people killed. In the same chapter, they estimate the total Vietnamese losses during the war period, which I guess includes civilian and military, I'm not sure, at about 2 million. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any idea what the what combined uh, casualty rate was for Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops? Oh, yeah, it was much, much, much higher. Um, probably at least twice, maybe three times higher than the South. The, by far the largest, actually by far, the, I think the largest number of people killed was actually Northern civilians from air attacks. I could be wrong about that. And again, it's difficult to judge who's PAV and who's VC and whatnot. But yeah, there's significant, um, much, much higher rate 
of, of enemy casualties than, than ally casualties. The North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, the National Liberation Front uh, took, I mean, this is the point I was going to get to next, you know, despite these claims, you know, the communist strategy is successful. I mean, the communists paid the piper. I mean, they, they took huge losses in that war. I mean, perhaps two million Vietnamese enemies, it could be as high as that number, died in that. So, I mean, to suggest somehow that, you know, this was a walkover is absurd, and no one, I don't think anybody writes that, and if anybody would suggest that, it would be preposterous. I mean, the Americans, you know, really pounded Vietnam. I mean, technologically, yeah, it was, it was an awesome display of power. There's no question about that. And, and this, you see this, I mean, that's why I showed the burned out village, just to show, you know, what we're talking about here. I mean, a B-52 can, can do a lot of damage, uh, howitzers, mortars, artillery, just as Viet Cong ambushes. And I mean, the VC have, you know, they're not fighting with sticks and stones either. They have, well, they have a lot of M M-14s and M-16s, which they get off the Arvin. And they also have uh, uh, Soviet um, surface-to-air missiles and uh, Chinese uh, uh, weapons and, and whatnot. And the Pavin's very well armed when the war becomes more conventional. Um, uh, what I'd like to see is a breakdown. I'm not sure I have or, or whether there's one available uh, of, for example, uh, southern Vietnamese Arvin casualties from like 1971 on and things like the Easter Offensive and, and some of the, uh, in the final offensive. I suspect they're going to be much higher at that point than at any time prior to that because the wars were conventional and, for example, in the Easter Offensive and in the final offensive, Pavin just poured into Vietnam and it, it really got ugly. But again, I mean, you know, it would be nice to see a breakdown of casualties year by year, battle by battle. Yeah. Uh, just a couple questions. On the high casualty rate for Arvin, mm -hmm. didn't a lot of that come from their higher uh, exposure as the primary yeah. uh, instrument in the Village Hamlet program where they're continually being slaughtered no, by their own people? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, even we talk about the American takeover of the war, and but at the same time, the numbers were much, much lower. I mean, the Americans are fighting much less than the Vietnamese are. So it's, you know, in a sense, it's an Americanization. But at the same time, the Vietnamese are given responsibility for Hamlet security. And, you know, Arvin troops are supposed to be the first line of, of, of fighting. I mean, uh, you know, as, as historians of the United States, it's a lot easier to find out about the U.S. role in the war than the Vietnamese war. Uh, the Vietnamese scholars have had very, a lot of difficulty writing about this. Records aren't available politically. It's real, real sensitive to do that. So, I mean, you know, we can tell you a lot about what the Americans did in Vietnam. That's easy. What the Vietnamese did is much more difficult to get a, get a beat on. And much of it, as I said, is like American conceptions of the Vietnamese. And a lot of Vietnamese take offense at, at what the Americans say about them. So this is still, I think, you know, a, a, you know still books there that need to be written. There's still information there that needs to be figured out. Has there been any writing on uh, the uh, failure of Johnson or the refusal of Johnson to mobilize our economy for war, and if there was that kind of general mobilization, the, uh, the, the consistent corruption and screwy situation in Vietnam might have been more exposed to the American people if, if the nation was yeah. mobilized. I mean, yeah, there's several, I mean, they're uh, not necessarily a, a great body of it, but a lot of, especially conservative writers, have suggested that was a real a huge error on LBJ's part not to do that. And they tend to look at it and say, well, this would have solved everything. And I think, you know, you bring up a good point. This may have, in fact, you know, there's always a flip side. Yeah. You know, yeah. if we had done this, it would have worked out, you know, this way. Well, in fact, it might have worked out the exact opposite. And there's always potential whenever you make a decision to, to, to actually things could come out worse. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, right. There's, there's, there's obviously a possibility there, too. Um, and clearly things like the Buddhist, the Buddhist uprising in, in i Corps was called the, the struggle movement. And so, I mean, and this, even though it's suppressed in 1966, this continues. These tensions between Buddhists in the military in Arvin continue for, for a lot of time after that. So it's, it's really a fairly dicey situation. So this is the situation in which the United States finds itself. Now, what, what's the, what do the Americans do? There's a picture of Westmoreland again. I've, I've shown you that before, uh, just to kind of refresh our memory. What does Westmoreland do? Well, Westmoreland decides that he is going to fight a fairly aggressive war. Um, in Vietnam, he develops, uh, when he comes over, he comes over there in 64, kind of treads water, and then in 1965 gets this massive infusion of troops, and at that point develops a, a three-phase strategy. Um, from the time the troops arrive, beginning to arrive in July of 1965, through the end of the year, Johnson's goal, uh, let me kind of show this on a map, it'll probably be a little easier to see, 
uh, John, so Westmoreland's goal will be to secure the coast here, the southern coast, all right? So America's first goal is basically to secure the populated areas um, and essentially to halt the downward trend, to retard the enemy's progress. So that would be the first phase, which is July through the end of 1965. The second phase, which would be uh, in the early months of 1966, which would coincide with the dry season there, the end of the monsoon season, would see <coughs> American and Arvin troops drive the VC out <coughs> and cut off infiltration. And the third phase from 1966 to whenever, probably a year or so, would be to actually end the insurgency altogether. So if one follows this to its logical conclusion, Westmoreland is anticipating, uh, if not victory, uh, a real attack on the Viet Cong that will succeed in more or less ending the insurgency really by 1967-68. Okay, this is obviously, in retrospect, quite a fantasy. Um, what, what's the reality of it? Um, the United States intervenes in time to save the RVN. No question about that. Again, the, these are always what-ifs because we don't know, but it's quite possible that the RVN, again, would have collapsed without this large-scale American intervention. We can argue that was the case when Kennedy took over and uh, you know, intervened. We can argue that was the case in 64, around the time of Tonkin and thereafter. We can argue that was the case in 1965, in March, when the first combat troops come ashore. And it's probably the case again in, in mid-65, when Americanization occurs. At each of those points, the Viet Cong were, it appeared, and they thought, on the verge of victory, and the Americans come in. So common, you know, conventional wisdom, you know, which, again, is counterfactual, because we don't know what would have happened if things had gone differently. But at least conventional wisdom at those points was that American intervention saved the RVN. Uh, and you'll see this happen again. You know, uh, uh, it's not unusual. So American intervention is successful enough to prevent the RVN from collapsing. Right? Westmoreland is going to take what he perceives as a fairly aggressive approach, and the hallmark of this is going to be the strategy of attrition. Right? And this is going to be one of the more controversial aspects of the war. What is attrition? What is the strategy of attrition? One, not one, many generals call this a strategy for defeat. Westmoreland basically decides that the Americans' best advantage, the American and the Arvin's best advantage, is its numbers and its technology, especially weaponry. So it's going to use this huge superiority in the air and on the ground in weapons to erode or attrit, attrition, erosion, gradually wear away the Viet Cong to the point where they can no longer recruit in the south or infiltrate from the north to make up for their losses. When this happens, when America has defeated and damaged the Viet Cong so badly that they can no longer compensate for their losses, the Americans will have reached what Westmoreland calls the crossover point. Let me see if I can recall my old math symbols. This is when the losses are greater than the replacements. Is that right? Yeah. The crossover point, it'll be when the, you know, let's say, VC losses are greater than their ability to replace through recruitment or infiltration those losses. How do we do this? By attrition. We erode them. We kill them so much. So we kill so many of them, damage them so badly, that they will no longer be able to replace what they've lost. All right? This is Westmoreland strategy. Uh, cynics might suggest that it sounds a lot like World War I, uh, minus, of course, the trenches. But um, the idea that it's, it's very similar. I mean, this, is, this, was, this was European strategy in World War I to attrit the enemy. Okay? Um, and Westmoreland has been criticized stridently by everybody, I mean, not just anti-war people, but by people within the military uh, for this strategy. Um, actually, if you want to be kind of, kind of smart-alecky about it, attrition actually worked, worked, worked perfectly for the other side, for, for the enemy, uh, who was able to 
withstand these losses. And in fact, if anybody suffered from attrition, it was the United States, the country which took the lowest amount of casualties, but actually had the least uh, political resiliency to deal with it. Uh, the Pavan and the VC, the, the communists, were far more capable of suffering these losses, both because they could replace them, they had a, a more rigid society, they were far more dedicated to their cause, uh, and they had a larger pool uh, from which to draw. Uh, had the United States tried to throw two million men in the field in Vietnam, I mean, you, know, you think the campuses were bad, I mean, I think it was quite possible it could have gotten much, much, much worse. You know, they start drafting Harvard and Yale boys and you know, pretty soon their daddy's called the draft board and you know, all hell breaks loose, right? Um, so this is Westmoreland's strategy, right? I guess, unfortunately, in retrospect, the Americans never understood that attrition actually played to the enemy's strength, which was manpower and their ability to more rigidly control their military forces in the society that was under siege. I mean, it's a lot easier for Ho to rally people around the cause than it ever will be for LBJ. Ho is under attack. He has the mantle of nationalism. He can institute very tight controls because it's a society under siege. Uh, and, you know, the United States just can't make that same argument. So the U.S. Is obviously has far less uh, political ability to deal with losses than the enemy will. And McNamara uh, especially never understood that. Robert McNamara, the defense secretary, we've talked about him before, a firm believer in technology, computers, data. Uh, he believed that the enemy could never hold out in the face of these losses. Uh, kind of one of the key uh, elements in McNamara's approach to the war was the body count. This is how they judged how things were going. I've mentioned this before. It's not like World War II where you can say, well, we just, uh, you know, we liberated Paris. You know, that's a very visible sign of success. You can't do that in Vietnam, for one thing, because, you know, they're always in denial over who controls a village anyway, but it's not real clear cut, and you're talking about people who may or may not support you. So what is, how do you judge how you're doing? You know, do you liberate Hanoi, or do you liberate Saigon? Well, Saigon's under our control, so you don't liberate it, right? So it becomes a body count. We kill a lot of them. So every week, they would release official statistics on enemy killed versus North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese killed. All right, and um, uh, the, the enemy killed numbers were always real questionable. Uh, there was, you know, kind of jokes among American soldiers. If it's dead and it's Vietnamese, it's a VC. If it's a water buffalo, it's a VC. I mean, you could really, I mean, I've seen many accounts where people would just go out in the field and, you know, really wildly inflate the number of enemy killed because McNamara wanted to hear that. So, you know, if, if you bomb a village, that was, acute, what was considered to be harboring Viet Cong. Maybe you killed 10 Viet Cong, maybe zero, maybe all of them were. But it doesn't matter because if you kill 50 people in that village, more likely than not, all 50 of those are going to be put down in the, in the VC part of, of the, the casualty chart. So you have a body count of 50. I mean, it could be 95-year-old grandfathers or, or five-year-old kids, and they're going to be included in that as well because McNamara demands it. This is the only way that you can show progress and, you know, if you're an officer, you don't want to uh, run afoul of your superior. So there's a real tendency, and this comes from the military itself. Um, uh, after the war was over, General Douglas Kennard did a survey of American officers in Vietnam. And I think one of the things they criticized more than anything else was the body count. They just said it, it didn't allow them to fight, uh, you know, a war that they would have liked to fight because they were so concerned with building these numbers up because, you know, that was the, that, that was Pentagon's directive. We want big body counts. As I said before, McNamara, at one point when somebody hands him a report showing that attrition doesn't work based on kind of ideas and ideology, he says, uh, where's your data? Give me something I can put in the computer. Don't give me your damn poetry. So this is McNamara's approach. I need numbers. Okay. Uh, based on this, then, uh, uh, Westmoreland uh, pursues attrition. And a key to attrition, of course, is another term I've used before, search and destroy operations. Search and destroy is exactly as it implies. You go out and you engage the enemy and wipe it out, all right? Uh, search and destroy operations also include things like uh, herbicides. You deforest an area. If the Viet Cong is using the jungle cover for uh, hiding places or for sanctuaries, you just get rid of it. So you use herbicides to wipe out all the forest there. Uh, you level villages with bombardments. If these villages are accused of harboring the VC, like the the photo uh, we saw earlier, and you resettle the population first in the 19, early 60s through things like strategic hamlets and then through other kinds of programs to resettle the population when it's considered to be under attack. Okay? 
um, again, these these strategies in the long run don't win the war, but you know, keep in mind too, they, they do work to, to the extent that they damage the enemy quite seriously. I mean, the level of technology, the level of weaponry, the, the amount of armaments is, is huge. And so the Viet Cong take heavy, heavy, heavy losses as a result of that. Uh, a lot of VC are wounded and killed. Um, uh, the numbers uh, are, are huge, but in the end it doesn't cause them to lose the war. They tended to find a way to withstand attacks and repace their losses. And maybe the best example of this was the famous battle at Yedrong uh, in 1965. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. If, if you're really interested in getting the, the nuts and bolts of it, there's a book out. It was on the New York Times bestseller list several years ago, uh, written by a, 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 a General Joseph Moore, who was the commanding general, I think, uh, at, at Yedrong, called We Were Soldiers Once in Yang. Um, Yedrong is, uh, let's see. He's not on the map. Uh, it's up around here, Yedrong Valley. It's in two corps. It's in the Central Highlands. If I'm missing it, yell out and tell me, but I don't think it's on this one. I thought it would be, but it's around here. It's not far from Cambodia. Um, um, it's in the Central Highlands near the Cambodian border. It's not terribly far from Pleiku, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's southwest, right. From Pleiku, I, I mean, I'd say it's around there. Yeah, it's a valley, but you really can't tell from this map. But kind of where the V is in Vietnam, it's kind of around there. Um, uh, the seventh, for the U.S. Army Seventh Cavalry uh, had responsibility, or elements of the Seventh Cavalry had responsibility for the area around Yadrong, and the Seventh Cav met the Pav in there. So this is more of a conventional war. And this is in the Yadrong Valley in November of 1965. This is a set piece battle, which was fairly unique. You don't see too many of these in Vietnam. In this battle, uh, the US killed huge numbers of um, Pavan soldiers, perhaps 2,000, 2,500, and took uh, losses much smaller than that, about three or 400. So the enemy loses anywhere from seven to 10 times more troops than the US does. Now for Westmoreland, this is conclusive evidence that attrition works. And as a result, uh, he and McNamara aren't gonna look back. They're not really gonna change their mind on these things. Uh, for the Pavan, however, uh, Yadrong didn't mean all that much. Uh, one of the commanders there, uh, Jap was the kind of overall military commander, but the, the commander at Yadrong was uh, General Chu Hui Man. And he said the Pavan actually was trying to lure the Americans in a fight there, basically for training purposes. I mean, that sounds kind of ca you know, cavalier or callous, but in fact, they were trying to learn more about the way Americans would fight. Uh, uh, Chu Hui Man, the uh, Pavan general, says, we wanted to lure the tiger out of the mountain. We didn't have any plans to liberate the land, only to destroy troops. So the goal there is to see how the Americans would fight, uh, to, to, to force them into battle, and to cause casualties, even if the casualties were far uh, lower than the number of casualties they took. Um, the Pavan learned a lot of lessons from Yadrong. This is in November of 65. From that point on, you rarely see Jop or the Pavan uh, get involved in big unit engagements like that unless it's on terms that they consider favorable. How do you spell the name of the uh, place where this battle oh, took place? I-A-D-R-A-N-G. Yeah, here we go. I-A-D-R-A-N-G. And that I is pronounced with like a Y, yeah? Kind of, yeah. I mean, my pronunciations are not terribly effective, but yeah, it's kind of Yedrong Valley. Does that sound all right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the Vietnamese don't consider Yedrong, they, they consider it educational, they don't consider it catastrophic. Westmoreland, however, thought otherwise. And so after Yedrong, he will continue this kind of operation, and always with the fairly similar results. The number of casualties, the body counts always look great. The number of casualties that the enemy suffers is always going to be significantly, oh, way higher than the number of casualties the Americans suffer. Uh, for example, uh, there are three major operations in 66 and 67. They were called Attleboro, uh, Cedar Falls, and Junction City. I'll write them down here. I guess I could have put them up there. This is you know, drawing it after. Attleboro, 
Cedar Falls Junction City. These take place in an area, let's go back to the map here, uh, near Saigon uh, called the Iron Triangle, right? And it's kind of like this, I think. All right, it's in the south, kind of a, a bit south of outside of Saigon. This area is called the Hi Iron Triangle. In these operations, which occur in 66 and early 67, I think Junction City is the last of these three, which is in January of 1967, uh, the United States uses infantry, armor, and airborne units. And the goal there is to clear the Iron Triangle out, outside of Saigon uh, of, of VC units. Uh, the idea there is to use a tactic in which um, you get American units at one end of the war zone uh, to essentially, you know, crush the uh, uh, VC um, to uh, uh, drive them into units at the other end. I think hammer and anvil is the kind of a military application of it. It's, it's fairly conventional World War II type tactic. Um, and so the United States does that. I mean, in terms of numbers lost, the Viet Cong in, in any of these will lose a thousand or more soldiers. Right? The problem was before actually having these engagements, the United States would have to clear the area of civilians. And they did this by establishing free fire zones. Okay, And a free fire zone is a free fire zone. It doesn't really need much explanation. In a free fire zone, all Vietnamese are uh, susceptible to attack. They're all potential Viet Cong and they are potential targets of American firepower. So what does the U.S. do? It displaces and attacks an entire village in this area and basically alienate the very people they're there to save. So, yeah, you can kill a thousand Viet Cong, but you've also ticked off a lot of people who may not have an opinion either way, who may be VC but maybe aren't VC, who may even be pro-Arvin, but now you've resettled them or you have attacked them through the use of these free fire zones. Um, uh, and what happens afterward? Within six months after all of these engagements, the VC come back, basically as strong as they had been prior to the defeat. So again, in each of these cases, the Viet Cong's losses were much greater, ten, ten times greater than the United States. But politically, it backfired because people were alienated by this incredible use of American firepower, and the United States wasn't able to capitalize on that by securing these areas, and in fact, the Viet Cong come back in. Now. Who, who agrees with this analysis? Uh, basically, the entire U.S. Army. Bernard Rogers, I believe, wrote one of the books on General Rogers, later Supreme Commander of NATO, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, if, if you read his analysis of, of these battles, I think he wrote one on Cedar Falls and Junction City. Uh, it's, it's quite, you know, quite candid about the problems. Uh, and General William Depew, who was Westmoreland's deputy, even said that uh, in these engagements, the Viet Cong, quote, just backed off and waited. They were more elusive. They controlled the battle better. They were the ones who decided whether there should be a fight. All right, so this is, again, a fairly difficult situation, a fairly damning indictment of, uh, of uh, American strategy uh, in the aftermath of Yadrong. So even though I mean, Westmoreland's strategy of attrition, um, on one hand, is quite successful to the extent that it causes huge enemy losses, um, at the same time, it uh, um, doesn't really lead in any way to any kind of success. Right? So what happens as a result of that? Uh, the American commitment grows. Okay? American reinforcements grow, and this is when you start to see a fairly massive influx of American troops from 19, whatever, 54, if you want to take that. 55 is the starting date. Um, to 1964, you have, you know, kind of dribs and drabs of American troops. In 1964, there are about 80,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam. But from 65 to late 67, you go from you know, about 100,000 to 500,000 fairly quickly. So the, the number of reinforcements uh, increases quite dramatically. Right? Um, Westmoreland, uh, uh, remember, asks for uh, troops as needed, and Johnson sends them. Um, by 1967, uh, there are 470,000 American troops in Vietnam. In 1967, Westmoreland asks for 200,000 more troops. 
Uh, this is a request that LBJ only partially met, giving him 40,000 40, more uh, reinforcements. Right? So the American commitment grows. Uh, the use of air power grows. Um, the number of enemy dead grows. This is a period uh, of intense Americanization. Um, and if you look at, you know, look at all the situations, all the conditions, enemy losses, U.S. losses, uh, a number of troops, a uh, number of sorties flown, all of them are going to go up. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's a fairly basic picture that you can get out of Marilyn Young's book or elsewhere. Right? So clearly from 1965 to 1967, you see a massive American commitment to Vietnam. Okay. What's the downside of that? The enemy essentially retains the initiative in this period. Uh, throughout 1966 and 1967. So the irony or the tragedy for Americans is that as their commitment grows, the enemy's success grows pretty much proportionally. Um, for example, the United States decides um, in 1966 and 1967 to make a priority out of uh, stemming infiltration. How do they do this? They begin to attack the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I've mentioned the Ho Chi Minh Trail before, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. When you think of a trail, you think of, you know, something about five feet wide. And one of the Ho Chi Minh Trail is this massive network of uh, uh, supply routes, I mean, to the point where it becomes paved. Uh, it started, you know, it did start as a trail running from the north along Laos into Cambodia, where uh, Hanoi would use this as a way to send uh, uh, troops, uh, uh, reinforcements, or supplies to the south. I mean, at first it began incredible. You know, people would actually walk or ride by bicycle going through the jungle or through streams with, you know, little food, little to eat except Ho Chi Minh Trail mix. Um, that's, that's a joke. Push, push your buttons when you laugh so people can hear it, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, we need, yes. I think the Koreans ate the same thing or less. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, the United States throughout 66 and 67 is attacking that. You have constant bombardments of the Ho Chi Minh Trail the idea there is to stop infiltration, and it never works. Um, the enemy is infiltrating about 10,000 men a month into the south. Right? And again, that seems like a huge number, but it's 120,000 a year. In the overall picture, not, not as significant as one might think. Um, at the same time, it's recruiting about 3,000 monthly in the south. So the number of infiltrators in 66 and 67, according to American numbers, is larger than the number recruiting. Um, the American intelligence officers, led by General George McChristian, uh, believe that um, the Viet Cong are capable of getting about 200,000, almost 200,000 troops into the south from the north. Now, remember when I first talked about the crossover point. Basically, at these levels of infiltration, the Viet Cong are still at a net plus of about 75,000 troops. So Westmoreland claims attrition is going to lead the U.S. to the crossover point. By 1967, his intelligence chief, General George McChristian, is saying, no, we're still at least 75,000 off on infiltration alone. All right? So there's a real discrepancy as to how close they are uh, to the uh, uh, crossover point. In addition to that, the enemy's initiative is matched by continuing Arvin inactivity. Uh, American statistics claim that the Arvin is making contact with the enemy only 40% and only 40% of the engagements. This is why Westmoreland keeps asking for more troops. I mean, he doesn't say, you know, the Arvin stinks and we need more troops. He basically cleans it up, but, but the net effect of what he's saying is that the Americans have to take over more responsibility, right? Um, and this really kind of is, is really starkly shown in a memo from early 1967, which details the, the level of Arvin activity. In this period, there were 87 engagements. Uh, I can't remember what size. Fairly significant size or larger. So there are 87 decently sized engagements in Vietnam. Um, the initial statistics showed five enemy initiated engagements, right? Well, they went back and ever said, eh, this probably isn't right. They looked again, in fact, all 87 were initiated by the Viet Cong in this period from sev September of 66 to January of 67. So initially, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or a Wheeler, sees this and he sees, you know, five engagements. Eh. They get the new numbers, which show actually 87. That in fact, the Arvin has no initiative at all. 
that the Viet Cong are determining the site, the nature of just about every battle there. And so what does, what does Wheeler do when he sees the statistics? He basically says, you have to kill these. He says, I cannot go to the president and tell him, contrary to my reports, that we are not sure who has the initiative in South Vietnam. Okay? Westmoreland tells, Wheeler tells Westmoreland to kill it, to kill the document. Do not let LBJ see it. He said, these numbers, if they appear in Washington, if they appear in the media, quote, will literally blow the lid off of Washington. Essentially, what Wheeler is saying is we have just lost the basis for war. I mean, we've claimed that American troops are there because we're turning the tide in Vietnam. And these statistics show that, in fact, that's not at all the case, that the enemy retains the initiative overwhelmingly, right? Uh, Westmoreland essentially buys into that to the point where um, he doesn't release the statistics, but neither does he change his approach to Vietnam. We'll talk more about that shortly, but he continues this pursuit of attrition, right? Why does he do that? Because what else can he do? He doesn't have a whole lot of choices. LBJ, more than anything, wants progress. Johnson wants identifiable progress. He wants to be able to say, this is why we're doing well in Vietnam. How does he say that? We've killed this many soldiers. We've destroyed this many villages. He needs, like McNamara, something he can actually touch and taste and feel. He needs something objective and measurable. And hearts and minds doesn't cut it. Well, we won 10 hearts and three minds. You can't say anything like that. You can't judge it. You can't measure it. It's not something that really identifies. But if you say, we killed, we had an engagement, and we killed 2,500 Viet Cong, and we only lost 300, then that's something you can identify with. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, from, from 65 to 8, when it's pretty clear that the Arvin is, uh, the reputation of the Arvin is tapering off, um, are Westmoreland and, and uh, policymakers still continuing to put uh, pressure on the Saigon government to increase the, the manpower, the, the, the skills, whatever, of the Arvin? Or is that sort of a... Oh, no, absolutely. Because at some point, I mean, when they pull out, the Arvin's going to take over, they realize, yeah. certainly. Constantly pressuring the Arvin to, to uh, increase their, the manpower to take more responsibility for the war. I mean, it's, it's rhetorical pressure. A lot of complaining, a lot of griping. Real leverage, no. I mean, you know, it's the thing we talked about like in week two. You get to the point where the, you know, patron actually has power. I mean, what's the ultimate leverage? The U.S. going to cut and run? Do the Vietnamese actually believe for a minute that the United States is going to somehow leave? No. So, in the end, the Americans don't have a whole lot of leverage. So despite the, yeah, there's constant pressure. We, you know, increase draft numbers, draft them younger, take over more responsibility for the fighting. You know, each time Westmoreland says that, and then he turns around and says, I need more troops. So it's, it's fairly empty. It's kind of lip service. But in fact, the U.S. either has, you know, however you want to look at it, either has no leverage or it's unwilling to use its leverage. It's certainly not like, you know, with Chiang Kai-shek or Singh Man Rhee or anyone else. It's, you know, what's, what's the alternative? Reform or we're going to leave? No one expects them to say that. They know they're not going to. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a... a a real initiative or incentive to do anything on the part of the Arvin as long as the Americans will continue to just increase that's increase that's the increase. that's the general impression that the Americans had yeah that you know unless we actually use leverage there's nothing we can do and I mean it, it you know a lot of American officers had fairly decent relationships with the Arvin officers below the the general staff level and many of them agreed on that but you know at that level the, the level of political intrigue was so great that there just wasn't you know well, for one thing, I mean, uh, you know, the Arvin retained control. A lot of American officers often complained that they should have had actual uh, command. The command structure should have been created, which gave the Americans control in Vietnam. But again, I mean, if that doesn't smack of colonialism, what does? You know, American troops actually running the Vietnamese army. Uh, so, you know, basically, you know, the Arvin ran the Arvin. And the United States could only suggest they do certain things. And they're always complaining and moaning about the Arvin's inability or unwillingness to do this. So, I mean, in the end, I don't think there's a whole lot of leverage there. And they certainly weren't willing to use the ultimate leverage, which was to say, see, we're out of here. And they knew that wasn't going to happen. So, yeah, there's not a whole lot of incentive, I think, to, to change. And Westmoreland, I mean, in a sense, Westmoreland is a, is a tragic figure in the Greek sense in that he's really boxed in. He doesn't have a whole lot of options. Uh, what can he do? He continues his policy of attrition even though he knows that that's not going to have a huge impact. At, at a meeting in, I think it was in Guam in 1967, he has a wonderful little uh, analogy here. He says, killing gorillas is like killing termites with a screwdriver, where you have to kill them one by one, and they're inclined to multiply as rapidly as you kill them. Right? That's a wonderful analogy, isn't it? I mean, it's also you know, incredibly difficult to comprehend how this guy could understand that and continue what he was doing.
you know, we can kill them off, but, you know, it's incredibly difficult and painstaking. In guerrilla war, the general mathematics of it is, is that you have to kill off 10 of them for one of yours. So we can do that, but in fact, you know, they're able to reproduce themselves either through recruiting or infiltration or whatever as fast as we can get rid of them. Westmoreland said that? Yes, yeah, Westmoreland, yeah. Um, so what does this mean? There are 470,000 troops in Vietnam in 1967, right? And killing the enemy is like killing termites with a screwdriver. If, this is Westmoreland and Wheeler's analysis, if we keep 470,000 troops in Vietnam, it's simply a meat grinder, okay? 470,000 troops is a meat grinder. No progress, continued bloodshed, right? If we get 200,000 more, we can't guarantee success. We just think it'll be better, right? This is not a terribly uh, a sanguine projection, and so it's not surprising that LBJ gives them 40,000 rather than 200,000. In addition to that, Johnson, I think with good reason, is afraid that continued escalation and dramatic escalation, 200,000 troops at once, could provoke uh, uh, involvement from, from China especially. Um, so Westmoreland doesn't have a whole lot of options. Uh, he will you know, talk about the success of, of, uh, inf of uh, attrition. You know, we've turned the corner. Uh, there's a new day ahead. Privately, however, he's going to say, you know, killing, killing gorillas is like killing termites with a screwdriver. Johnson, for his part, is never going to give Westmoreland 200,000 more troops. So what does this mean? Uh, you basically have a fairly static situation. I mean, clearly the level of destruction and firepower is much greater, but the level of success or the actual nature of the war hasn't changed a great deal. Despite that, Westmoreland knows that politically Johnson can't tolerate anything short of success. So in November of 1967, Westmoreland is brought home essentially for a public relations tour. He speaks before the National Press Club, he speaks before Congress, he does a lot of TV shows, you know, Face the Nation and stuff like that. And he utters the famous words that, uh, well, a couple famous statements. One, he says, we've reached the crossover point. We are now re killing the enemy at numbers greater than he can replace. We are now killing more VC than they can replace. Now, his own, infiltra his own intelligence chief, General George McChristian, would say that, in fact, the uh, uh, Viet Cong had a surplus of 65 to 75,000. Westmoreland claims they reached the crossover point. And his more famous utterance, of course, was that there was now, quote, light at the end of the tunnel. Pretty soon we're going to have this thing in good shape and we're going to start bringing American troops home. It's an election year. Johnson can't have anything but that kind of statement. One of the, yeah. I can't help but thinking if Westmoreland knew about fire ants, the whole war could have been different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this becomes the object of a major court case. If any of you remember, CBS ran a documentary in 1982 called The Uncounted Enemy of Vietnam Deception, in which they claimed that Westmoreland purposely suppressed information about the number of infiltrators and the number of recruiters because he didn't want Johnson to know how bad things were. And again, I mean, uh, in court, Westmoreland basically punted. He basically dropped the case before a verdict was reached. Um, and this, it got to be fairly complex dealing with things like who's VC and who isn't, and dealing with ralliers and, you know, supporters, villagers, things like that, people who didn't carry weapons. But, I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the, the whole case was kind of extraneous and unnecessary because did Westmoreland know there were more? Of course he did. That's his job, right? Did he lie to the president? Well, why wouldn't he? I mean, yeah. you know, your job isn't to go and say, look, we're in deep crap, you know, and this isn't going to... Of course, you know, he knew that the problem was there, and he told Johnson something Johnson wanted to hear. That's his job. I mean, I, I, I you know, did that lose the war? That's absurd. I mean, to, to, to scapegoat Westmoreland for that, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, Ted occurred, and they blew it. They blew it. It was a massive intelligence failure, and we'll talk more about that later. But at the same time, um, Westmoreland could legitimately look at these numbers and make anything he wanted out of them. What's VC? You know, do you count some old woman who makes rice for Viet Cong soldiers? I mean, should she be encountered in the order of battle? I mean, OB is, is real, real subjective in, in a guerrilla war. This isn't like you can chart units and you know what they got. So, um, but at the same time, I mean, it's, it's clear that when he says we've reached the crossover point, he knows that ain't the case. And in fact, McChristian um, testified against Westmoreland during the CBS trial. So, and, and you know, they, uh, 
uh, it was very difficult. I mean, you know, McChristian, I think, I think it was McChristian, uh, they both graduated from West Point class of 1936, and, and McChristian basically said that Westmoreland should take his ring off. He had dishonored the Army. So it got quite personal and quite ugly. Um, but at the same time, I mean, Westmoreland, I do not believe when he said, yes, we've reached a crossover point, he believed that. He knew that that wasn't the case. But at the same time, you're going to tell Big Daddy from the Pedernalis that, that he's up the crick? You know, sorry, Lyndon, you're not going to do that. You know, so, um, so in 1967, November of 67, Westmoreland says, we can see some light at the end of the tunnel, all right? Harold K. Johnson, the Army Chief of Staff, says, uh, uh, he writes to Creighton Abrams, who was going to take over for Westmoreland about six months down the road, that uh, I, hope, uh, I hope Westy has not dug a hole for himself with regard to his prognostications. The platform of false prophets is crowded, right? Uh, Harry K. Johnson is one of my favorite people from that entire period. Just incredibly blunt, while everybody else is kind of, you know, you know, looking at a purple sky and talking about how great things are, Johnson just cuts through and says, uh, uh, the platform of false prophets is crowded. You know, we've heard this before, and why should we believe it this time? Okay? Yeah? This question spins off the discussion going on, uh, one of the discussions going on on the email site. Hypothetically, mm -hmm. had Goldwater been elected, which, or more realistically, had the Johnson administration uh, adopted a, a more hawkish, you know, military position, what do, what could have, what would have been the possible outcomes of that? I mean, before you do that, you, you can get very specific. Does that mean more ground troops, an invasion of Laos, based on what more air on, power? On, on what Goldwater said he would do? So, yeah, Gold, Goldwater made some fairly general statements to the point where you know, I'm going to take it to him. I mean, I'm not going to let this happen, but he never really got specific. And unfortunately, I mean, you know, if you're going to involve yourself in counterfactuals, you should know more than that. I mean, my, my assumption was always that, West, that Goldwater was talking about massive air power. I mean, people said atomic bomb. I don't even know if he would have done that in 1964. But, you know, my impression was that we're going to kind of bomb him back to the Stone Age. I don't know if he or LeMay used that phrase, but, I, you know, it tends to be associated with Goldwater. And again, the assumption I always had with Goldwater was that he was counting on air power, in which case I don't think it would have made much difference because, as the Army pointed out, you know, air power is fairly transient. Would a massive in, a influx of American troops from the beginning, 500,000 troops in 1964, uh, John Prados, who's a very good scholar, has pointed out Vietnam could have never handled it. There was no country there to handle an influx of 500,000 troops. They had one port. They had no communications. They had no barracks. They had no roads. They had very little primitive communication network. So it would have just overwhelmed the country. So, I mean, you can create all kinds of scenarios for, you know, what ifs. If they had done this, then the war would have been different. But you can also create a counter scenario for each one talking about the problems that they had. If he had unleashed massive air power, what would that have done? Well, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I can't believe it would have broken the will of the Vietnamese considering the amount of air power expended. And whether you expend this in one year or over a period of three years, I mean, it's still pretty brutal. And the fact is the Vietnamese weathered it fairly well, just as in World War II the British did during, during the Blitz, or the Germans did, you know, or, or, the, or the Japanese did before the atomic bomb. So, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, you can create a counterfactual to answer each of those at any given point. Um, politically, it was impossible, I think, for LBJ to do more than that. Had LBJ said, this is going to be a full-blown war and we're going to send half a million troops in, I, I just don't see that happening. I mean, in fact, he understood that in 1964 you couldn't let that happen, so he ran as a peace candidate. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know. Um, what would an invasion of Laos or Vietnam have entailed? What numbers of troops? What kind of casualties? Would it have drawn in? I mean, it's a legitimate question. You know, people kind of poo-poo. Would it have drawn in China? Why not? I and mean, they did it in Korea. That was only, you know, 15 years earlier. They're going through a cultural revolution. There's a bunch of crazy zealots around there. I'll mention later. There were Red Guard who were crossing into Vietnam. Pham Von Dong protested, and Mao had to apologize for it. I mean, there were 100,000 Chinese advisors in the North. You know, does the U.S. actually want to get involved in a, in a, in a, in a fight now, in a, in a war with China? So, I mean, that, you know, take that into account. Uh, the U.S. was terrified about bombing ships in Haiphong. I mean, when Nixon comes in and takes measures that would seem to be provocative, he has all kinds of options that LBJ didn't have. And Nixon, you know, basically was trying to buy time because the war was done by then. I mean, Nixon, I don't think, had any illusions of actually turning this around and winning in any meaningful way. Yeah. But that, 
assumption is still kind of crucial to what, you know, I guess we could call the re revisionist military histories of the mm -hmm. war, the Harry Summers reading oh, that absolutely. we did. He seems to imply that if the U.S. had mobilized you know, formally for war and invaded North Vietnam in 1966, that, that that's when it could have been won. I can't prove him wrong. <laughs> you know, there's no way to refute that what-if type stuff. You know, if, uh, you know, if the Padres had won four games last year, they would have won the World Series against the Yankees. You know, refute that. You can't. I mean, you know, Summers says that. But, you know, in fact, I don't see how Johnson could have mobilized in 1965, you know. I don't think the, the conditions were, were appropriate at the time. I don't think it was a possibility. So, yeah, make it quick and then we'll... When we come back from break, yes. I'd be interested in looking at the idea that we even wanted this war to stop before it did as a military-industrial complex of Dow Chemical and Ola Matheson making bullets and bombs and general dynamics. We don't want this war to stop. And we'll be right back after that thought. <laughs>